Professor, thank you. I'm Evan Smith. Uh, uh, I am indeed the editor-in-chief and CEO of the Texas Tribune. After this morning, I'm actually happier to say that I'm the person who has I guess, to work with Emily Ramshaw uh, every day. I was quite honored to see uh, what she did today and was so uh, proud from a distance. Um, and I am indeed pleased to introduce and lead and then lead a brief discussion with and then lead a conversation among the audience with um, Martin Barron, the executive editor of the Washington Post. Before I do, let me play a little mood music for you. Certainly nobody in this room needs to be told that these are interesting times in the Chinese proverb, both a blessing and a curse sense for American journalism. We are all constantly, incessantly, inevitably, annoyingly wrestling with questions of commerce versus content, a word, content that I know from talking to Marty before he hates, so I'm already getting into trouble with him. Commerce and content, free and paid, print and digital, vertical and horizontal. Questions about the changing competitive set, about the pace of innovation, about the value and relationship of individual and institutional brands. Most of all, we're litigating that age-old couch in the therapist's office question about optimism and pessimism, about how good or bad we feel at present about this thing we do, about this life we've chosen. And on this last count, at least, Marty Barron has shown his hand. As he'll explain in a few seconds, he believes journalism is entering one of its most exciting periods in decades. Quote, there is good reason for optimism about our field, he says, and this is a good time to talk about it. And so he will. Marty has been at his job at the Post for about 15 months, an eventful 15 months they have surely been for the paper on both the journalism and business sides of the ledger. Previously, he edited the Boston Globe for nearly a dozen years, during which time the paper won six Pulitzer Prizes for public service, explanatory journalism, national reporting, and criticism. Before that, he was a top editor at several of the biggest and most consequential dailies in America, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Miami Herald, where he played a lead role in breaking news coverage of the Ilion Gonzalez raid, which itself won a Pulitzer. It was at the Herald that Marty began his career all the way back in 1976. Born and raised in Tampa, he has undergraduate and master's degrees from Lehigh University. Please join me in welcoming Marty Barron. Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, for uh, having me and inviting me to UT Austin. Um, I apologize for the formal nature of these initial remarks. Uh, they'll get less formal uh, very quickly. Um, but uh, Rosenthal asked me to talk a little bit before he's nodding, so I, he really did. Asked me to talk a little bit. I asked not to talk, uh, just to answer questions, but he said, no, I should talk for a while. So uh, I do want to keep my remarks uh, relatively brief. Uh, then uh, Evan and all of you can ask questions about anything that you'd like. It's kind of remarkable looking up here because it looks like a commercial for Apple. Every single, <laughs> like, it's unbelievable. Um, poor Microsoft. Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, um, so I came up with this title that he asked me to come up with. It's the untold story why we should be optimistic about journalism. And I knew that that would be a bit of a, a bit of a risk. Uh, a profession in our business face uh, many problems, many pressures, of course. Uh, optimism is not always easy to find. Um, and sometimes it's actually perilous to admit, um, especially when you're in the middle of the turmoil, as I have been for 14 years as the editor-in-chief of a, of a newspaper. Uh, when I mentioned the title to the head of another news organization, he looked at me shocked. Uh, he then handed me his card and he said, send me your speech. I've got to read that. Um, and then he asked me to define what I mean by uh, something being good for journalism. Uh, did I mean it was good for the customer? Did I mean it was good for journalists looking for jobs? Did I mean it was good for existing journalistic institutions like his uh, and mine? And I responded that the third one, existing journalistic institutions, was not what I had in mind. Uh, um, that would have to sort itself out on its own, and it largely depended on what these institutions do on their own behalf. Um, I'll just note here, because I can't help myself, that I volunteered the title to this speech uh, well before the internet pioneer Mark Andreessen uh, wrote his now much cited blog post on how bullish he is about the news business and before others chimed in with similar thoughts. Uh, there may be a reason, of course, for me to feel particularly optimistic this year. I've been, as I said, top editor for 14 years. And uh, this year is, I'm fairly sure, the first year I haven't had to cut the budget and to reduce the staff. So it's a good feeling. 
uh, but I recognize uh, it's not a feeling that's universally shared by my colleagues at other news organizations. So I don't want to be Pollyannish, and I don't think I am. I sounded a similar optimistic tone in the speech to uh, New England editors a year and a half ago when I was editor of the Boston Globe, uh, well before I ever could have anticipated uh, the turn of events at the Washington Post. Uh, the truth is I could never have anticipated what has happened at the Post, uh, Don Graham selling us and Jeff Bezos buying us. Okay, so I'm now going to try a device that's become, uh, with these remarks, it seems kind of popular these days, a list or a listicle. Uh, as it's come to be known, uh, and I would say this is more list than listicle. Uh, so what follows are nine reasons to be optimistic uh, about journalism. So I'll start with number one, the basics. We've survived. Um, <laughs> we're still here, uh, real journalists doing real journalism. Uh, you know, not too long ago, people said that the New York Times would go bankrupt. It didn't. Uh, a few years back, the Boston Globe was threatened with a shutdown, and a gleeful critic advised me, its editor at the time, to practice saying, would you like fries with that? Uh, the Globe survived to do outstanding work and continues to do so today. Uh, about 25 years ago, I was at the Los Angeles Times as a senior editor, and Ted Turner, the founder of CNN, had come to visit. Uh, I was among those invited to a very nice lunch. He returned our hospitality with a warning, more accurately a prediction, that in 10 years, he said, the LA Times would be out of business. Uh, that would be due, he said, to 24-hour cable news. Um, the LA Times has had its struggles, but it's still very much in business, doing very good work, and its struggles today have had little, if anything, to do with CNN or 24-hour cable news. They're due to the internet, which has put pressure on a wide range of industries, not just ours. So the point is, we as an industry and as a profession are more resilient than people give us credit for and more resilient than we ourselves give, uh, give ourselves credit for. So number two, uh, new owners are bringing needed new capital and a range of disparate ideas, uh, rethinking the business models. Our new owner at the Post, Jeff Bezos, is among them. He's investing $250 million in cash in the purchase of the Post and in digital transformation, and, and millions more into initiatives aimed at, at growth and digital transformation. Uh, Red Sox owner John Henry has acquired the Boston Globe and is obviously rethinking its business model. He, too, is investing in improvements. At the Orange County Register, Aaron Kushner is trying a wholly different approach, emphasizing print and betting that a substantial investment in reporting resources will give the industry the jolt it needs. Warren Buffett and his people are bringing their own ideas about local journalism to newspapers in smaller communities. Uh, Minnesota billionaire Glenn Taylor has offered to buy the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, and we'll see what he has in mind. You don't have to believe in any one of these approaches to recognize that we're in a period of tremendous experimentation with the business models of legacy media organizations. Not all of these will work. My wager is that something will, and then others will follow. The variety of approaches is a big plus. We now have a living laboratory of business model experimentation. And the good thing is that some of these new owners have long-term perspectives. The payoff on experimentation does not have to be immediate. That's the case at the Washington Post, where our owner has spoken of giving us, quote, runway for experimentation. We will try a lot of things, and we'll have time to see if they work. Number three, uh, so I just spoke about legacy journalism organizations. As important is the blossom blossoming of new journalistic organizations. Some of these have been the creations of people who left legacy organizations to create ventures of their own, staffed solely by web-savvy digital-era journalists. Uh, of course, we recently experienced that at the Post with some staffers going off to form their own venture, funded by Vox Media, and I know Jim Bankoff was here yesterday. The New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have seen similar departures. Capital is now available for journalism entrepreneurship. It doesn't, it doesn't make my life any easier when people leave, uh, but overall it is healthy for journalism. Now, media pundits, uh, my favorites, have a habit of viewing these spinoffs as a sign of dysfunction in businesses like ours, a sign of the failings of legacy institutions like mine. In fact, these spinoffs are a sign of health in the industry just as the availability of capital for entrepreneurial spin-offs in Silicon Valley or here in Austin is a sign of vibrancy in the technology sector. Not all of these new ventures will succeed. Saying you're the next big thing and hiring a bunch of people is the easy part. Nor, by the way, are legacy media organizations ordained to fail. For example, The Atlantic, an old media organization once known for its magazine, 
uh, most Fruits Magazine, I should say, has become a vibrant online venture. But the new competition will translate into enormous innovation, and I might add, a bounty of jobs. New journalism nonprofits also add to the mix. Some are national in orientation, some regional, some investigative, and wealthy philanthropists are willing to fund them, and they have filled in some of the reporting gaps as traditional organizations have retrenched. Evan Smith and the Texas Tribune uh, have certainly done that here, and I'm not just saying that because he's about to grill me. The overall journalism ecosystem is now more varied and more colorful than before. Today's journalistic organizations have more distinct personalities. They have disparate approaches to informing readers. There is far less uniformity. Our field, as I said, is more colorful. We are in an era of journalistic entrepreneurship, and journalists will have to be entrepreneurial, building entirely new companies, working within new entrepreneurial ventures, or behaving as internal entrepreneurs to transform organizations that have stood for decades. And that leads to number four. New forms of storytelling have emerged, and they have proved particularly effective at connecting with readers. They can vary from listicles to data visualization that helps readers process a mass of information as never before. In many instances, the storytelling combines a variety of techniques. New article formats have been developed that ease readers into supporting material or supplemental material when they wish to know more. Interactive graphics, videos, other devices are presented contextually, integrated into stories in appropriate spots. The reader experience is enhanced, and readers are more engaged. And in the end, readers will be more satisfied. Number five, the pressures on our industry have forced us to pay keen attention to our customers, the readers, the viewers, the listeners. Now, we always talked about this. We did not always practice it. We often imagined that what we ourselves wanted to do was what our customers wanted from us. At the very least, we said it was good for them, and maybe it was. But the fact is, customers were not always consuming what we were feeding them. In some instances, we just assumed they were. We assumed that print readership equaled the readership of our stories. But if you ever sat in a coffee shop and watched people back then flip through a newspaper, you might watch in dismay as they flipped right past your story. Now we can be sure uh, that if our journalism doesn't connect with readers, viewers, and listeners, we can be sure that someone else will emerge to do it better. There is only there is only the only guarantee left in our business, uh, and that is competition, uh, intense competition. Number six, the current conditions in our in industry are opening up a vast array of new opportunities. Every year I'm asked by summer interns about job prospects. And I say that when you look at media defined broadly, we're seeing an explosion of opportunities. Don't judge job prospects solely by what's happening at legacy institutions. New career possibilities have opened up, and young people coming into journalism need to see them and to embrace them. By the way, many of these new opportunities do exist within legacy organizations. Their process of digital, transform digital transformation requires talent with a different set of skills and a more contemporary sensibility about how to connect with readers, viewers, and listeners. These legacy institutions still need strong traditional reporting and writing skills, but while those skills are necessary, they are not sufficient. New recruits need new technical skills, perhaps in coding, perhaps in video. More important, they also need an instinctive or highly developed sense of how the public is receiving and processing information today. This year in the Washington Post newsroom, we are hiring three dozen people, all with the goal of digital transformation, and we are doing exciting things. Lost in all the focus on change is that some of the most transformative developments in media are taking place at some of the industry's oldest institutions. Number seven, we are now seeing a whole new generation of journalists enter our field. This is hugely encouraging. They come with the skills required, with the right sensibilities. They can think well, write well. They're bright, they're energetic, they're enthusiastic. They love what journalism can do. They understand its vital role in society and they appreciate that there are new, highly effective ways to tell stories that need to be part of our daily toolbox. These young journalists are true digital natives, and it shows. Journalists of a previous generation can learn new digital skills. They can adapt. They can work hard and dil diligently at telling stories in new ways, and they can be really good at it. But digital is not their native language. It's like those who immigrate to this country as an adult. They can speak perfect, even elegant English, and yet their accents are unlikely to disappear. 
These new journalists enter the field without an accent that hints of foreignness to the new medium. Their familiar familiarity with the digital idiom is complete and it's natural. Number eight, perhaps most important, amid all the turmoil in our field, amid the persistent and pervasive anxiety among journalists, we're doing strong and important work. We're continuing to fulfill the journalistic mission. I'll talk here about papers other than my own and other than the biggest ones. Over the past year or so, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, disc the Sentinel disclosed a breakdown in the blood screening system for newborns, causing delays of days or weeks in treating ailments that require immediate attention. The Sacramento Bee reported on a Las Vegas, Las Vegas psych psychiatric hospital that over five years discharged 1,500 patients by putting them on Greyhound buses out of Nevada and bound for other, other states where they had no housing, no plans for treatment, and in some cases knew no one. Some were violent offenders who went on to commit crimes, including one murder. The Boston Globe reported on an abusive system in which the owner of the city's largest taxi fleet subjected hundreds of drivers to a system of continuous exploitation. Amid all this anxiety in our field, we should not forget the enormous amount of pioneering and profoundly difficult journalism that's being done. Now, I want to make clear to repeat that I am not a Pollyanna. I recently heard the Israeli president, Shimon Peres, describe himself as a dissatisfied optimist. Uh, that describes me, too, a dissatisfied optimist. I fully recognize that we face enormous challenges, to name just a few. There are serious unresolved questions about how investigative reporting will be funded, particularly at the state and local level. There are too few journalists providing the most basic coverage of state and local government, as well as their congressional delegations not to mention serving as diligent watchdogs of politicians and policymakers and the people in the private sector who exercise influence over them. Digging takes time and money and often expensive lawyers. Understanding of world affairs is weakened when American coverage comes from too few media outlets and too few reporters on the ground. There is no assurance that thoughtful, quality, in-depth journalism, which takes a lot of time, will not give way to gimmicks and clickbait that lead only to a lot of social sharing. The business models remain unsettled, and digital ad rates are declining as our product inventory, page views, keeps growing. In short, we have not found the answer or answers, and we don't know for sure if there are conclusive answers to be had anytime soon. But in our business, pessimism too often seems to prevail. Today's experimentation will involve failure. It requires us to try and then try again, People need to realize, to, people need to realize that. And those of us who are experimenting need not be embarrassed by it. All of you who are entering the profession or hope to stay in it need to be smart about this. Do not look at our field through the wrong end of the telescope. Look into the distance and see the genuine opportunities ahead of us. And that leads me to my final reason for being optimistic about journalism number nine. There is no acceptable alternative to optimism. <laughs> we cannot be successful if we are not optimistic, if we do not recognize opportunities and seize on them. If we are not, not optimistic, then why work to succeed? What use would it be? And if you are not working to succeed, no matter the obstacles, you are not working as you should. So if we hope for a better future, we must be confident that it is within reach, even if it is not within easy reach, and we must keep trying. I believe there are, in fact, ample reasons to be optimistic. I've cited some of them for you here today. I'm encouraged. I am excited. But I also choose to be optimistic, because only as an optimist can I envision a route to success. And only through optimism can I have faith that our important journalistic mission will be sustained. That conviction is what carries me to work every day and what drives me from one day to the next. So thank you.